been prepared, but there's been uh, three scriptures that have been resonating with me for the past few days. <clears throat> Two of those were said here on Sunday. One was remind I was reminded of yesterday. Uh, Psalm thirty-seven twenty-five. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. And yesterday I was reminded of Romans eight twenty-eight. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And the third one uh, is from pastor's sermon, Luke 1, 38. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. So the Lord said, I'm always going to provide for you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. So yesterday I did my taxes, and he did provide. Uh, my wife's not too happy about the outcome. <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, but you know, I've, I've been having a, um, an issue with the ceiling in my house. And every day that I get up and I look at it, I say, Lord, I know this is still hanging because you're holding it. <laughs> uh, so now I finally have the money to pay for the repair. Yay. I've been waiting for it since October. Lord. Yeah, so it's good. Uh, I still know what's going to happen out of this whole thing, you know, based on what he told me. Uh, I believe I got a revelation last uh, yesterday when I was uh, getting ready to go to work, but I'm not supposed to share it yet until it's time. So when the time comes, I will share that. Uh, you know, so it, it's good. He told me he's going to meet all my needs, and they have been met more than enough. I can't complain, life's good. Uh, I think another door opened up for me at work to get another promotion. Hallelujah. Yeah, so uh, I could have lied when I was submitting the application because one of the questions was, have you talked to your manager about applying for this position if you haven't been in your current position for more than 12 months? I could have said yes and talked to him the next day. But I said, no, I'm not gonna do it. Nope. So I got the email from Human Resources saying, well, because you did not meet these two requirements, we cannot put you in the pool of applicants. Well, that's fine. Turns out the position, the manager, is this lady that I worked with in the project that I was selected for last year. So she knows what I can do. So now God is shuffling the cards in there if it's for me, it's going to be. Amen. So, yep. we'll see. I'll let you know when I find out. Other than that, that's all I have. Glory. Good. Amen. Anyone wants to share anything? Prayer requests, testimony? All right. Well, let's stand. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for bringing us together here in your presence today. Father, where two or three are gathering your name, Lord, there you are. We can feel your presence in this place right now, Lord, pouring your grace, your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for all the provision, for bringing us together. And you know when to bring your people together, Lord, for everything you do has a purpose. And we are just glad, Lord, that we have been chosen by you to be part of that purpose. We thank you, Father, for everything that you do for us, everything that you will continue to do, Father, according to your word and your will. We thank you, Father, because we stand in your word, a word that we know that is true, because you cannot lie. 
We thank you, Father, for those that are here right now and those that are not. Will you guard their hearts, Lord? We know that they are here in spirit. And we know, Father, that when you are unfolding for this church, for the people in this church, for this region, this community, Lord, it's all going to be for your glory. Thank you, Father, for giving us the precious gift of your only Son for our salvation. transforming us into new people. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Father, it's all for your glory. For your glory, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Okay, let's speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease germ and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right. Well, I'll take the offering. As close as you want, consume this heart that longs to burn. I know this fire can hurt, but I will be worse here without you. For I
And as I stand in the flame, still I will say, I trust you, God. For I was made to dwell with you. And how I ache until
there's a cross that stirs our hearts and ancient cry desperate prayer it's the cry that Moses prayed here today hear our call show us your glory 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 Thank you for your faithfulness again tonight, Lord. Thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that in you we are always victorious. We thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in our lives, for the many unseen things. We thank you for the manifestations that we're believing for in the finished work, Lord, of the cross. We declare it done, Lord, in our lives, in Jesus' name. Nothing is impossible, Lord, for you've made all things possible. We trust you, Lord, for the great victory, Lord. Hallelujah. That victory, amen, yes. over death, hell, and the grave. We thank you, Lord, for every victory between now and then that declares your glory, your presence, and your power. We celebrate it tonight, Lord. Yes. We declare you are the mighty God, yes. the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Our Lord and our Savior, Hallelujah. our soon-coming King, yes, Lord. we bless you and praise you. In your name, hallelujah. 
the name above every name. In Jesus' name, amen. So praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Give him a hand clap tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Praise Thank God. Lord. Appreciate you all coming out tonight in spite of the weatherman's forecast. <laughs> Hallelujah. I heard the, one of them say, you could tell he was a little embarrassed because he'd been saying nine inches all day. And uh, when I left the house, it was one inch. And uh, he said, well, someone confronted him, and he just said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, why don't you predict the winner of next year's Super Bowl? And I thought, oh, wait a minute. First of all, that's a year from now, not today. <laughs> Second of all, we don't get paid for predicting the winner of the Super Bowl. He gets paid for predicting the weather. Now, that, I'll tell you what. If I'd had any clue when I was getting out of school that there was a job out there that you could be wrong anytime and still get paid good money, hallelujah, that would have been my, that would have been my career because I, had, I was already doing it. I just wasn't getting paid for it. I was making all kinds of bad decisions and poor choices and just never knew that that was actually a career uh, life. You know, that I could actually focus on something and use the, the gifts that I had. <laughs> Amen. So uh, praise the Lord. Amen. Well, anyway, whatever it is, it's what we get. So, you know, if uh, no matter what they forecast, we have to live with what we get. And so far, it doesn't look as bad as what they've been saying. So I'm, I'm good with it. Praise the Lord. It's uh, whatever it is this time of year, I'm, I always say it, it can't last long. So whatever it is, it's, it's, it's going to be short-lived because we're almost into March. We know that's girls' basketball, and, of course, we've got all the fear mongers out there that always tell us we have the worst storms of the year during the girls' basketball term. I think we have had a storm or two, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we have to expect some really horrible earth-shattering event during the basketball tournament, so... Like I said, if we get a storm now, it, it won't last because, come on, man, we're, we're daylight saving starts next month in March. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That means we've got to be close to spring, doesn't it? Amen. So good. There's good news on the horizon. Hallelujah. Amen. We just believe for warm weather and praise the Lord. So, all right, let's get on with this so I can get you out of here at a reasonable time tonight. I want to start uh, in the book of Matthew. And uh, we'll just, we're going to read beginning at uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, and we'll read right on through chapter 4, verse 11. Matthew 3, 13 through Matthew 4, 11. Now, we're talking about uh, spiritual warfare and what, you know, really what real spiritual warfare is. We think a lot of times of, you know, wrestling with the devil and, you know, coming from charismatic and, and Pentecostal backgrounds, a lot of times it's about screaming and hollering at the devil and, and all that stuff. Sometimes there's a place for that, but, but really the real challenge for us uh, when it comes to warfare, spiritual warfare, it's, it's really about right between our ears. It's where the enemy tries to attack us. It's where he always does. He goes after our identity, uh, tries to bring in condemnation, guilt, shame, all those things which have a tendency to neuter, if you will, the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, that's, that's where the enemy operates. And I want to show you that uh, through some uh, scriptures here that we're all really familiar with. So it's not like it's a brand new uh, uh, kind of place that we're going. It's just a way that we're going to look at this. So as soon as we can get those up on the board, praise the Lord, we'll... We'll go. There we go. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. And then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, 
in whom I am well pleased. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus saith unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, you know, outside of the crucifixion itself, uh, the baptism is the only event of Jesus' life that's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. It's mentioned in different ones at different times, but it's outside of the crucifixion. Baptism is the only one that is spoken of in all four of those Gospels. Amen? Amen? But only here in Matthew is the temptation recorded in detail. What goes on between the enemy and Jesus, right? So it's important, though, that we recognize how the baptism and the temptation are tightly connected. And they're tightly connected by a, one simple word, then. Praise the Lord. So let's look again here at Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And we'll read right down through uh, 4 and 1. A low and low voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So the then here is really like a therefore. If you read it, and you understand there aren't any chapters in the original writing. It's, it's divided up into chapters when they made the codex or the books of the Bible. But in the original writing, it was one continuous writing. So he says, uh, lo, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And it's like, therefore, was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Right? So... After this great blessing and this success came trial and temptation. Now let me ask you a question, and you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but let me just ask this. What, what if you could overcome all of your faults, all of your, all of your flaws? What if all of your decisions were wise ones? What if you perfectly understood the times and the seasons? We're always hearing about that. I mean, what if you could just perfectly understand exactly what's going on at this particular time in the spirit realm and so on and so forth, right? What if your faith never wavered? I mean, what if you never, ever even thought there's any possibility that this cannot happen? After all, God said it, right? What if you were perfectly pleasing to God? Surely, your life would be one that escaped trial, temptation, tribulation, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. eh, eh, wrong. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's why I told you not to raise your hand. I don't want to humiliate you. But, I mean, think about this for a minute. God has just said that Jesus' life is perfectly pleasing to him. Right? And the Spirit descends on him to guide him. The Spirit, amen? Jesus led of the Spirit. Which is why we have the Holy Spirit today, to lead us and guide us, right? 
So immediately, God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am perfectly pleased. Everything about him is right. And all of a sudden, then, therefore, the enemy shows up. No, the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Praise the Lord. Look, look, let's look at what happens here. He's loved, he's affirmed, and he's empowered by God. Then, then was Jesus led, right? He's loved, he's affirmed, he's empowered, and the attack of the enemy. Praise the Lord. So here's, the, here's one thing that this demonstrates. It, it, it demonstrates the complexity of evil, the power of evil in the world. It's not just, you know, I mean, the, some people think, well, evil is just evil. You know, there's bad people. And certainly people just by themselves can do some pretty wicked stuff, pretty evil. But there is a greater evil. I mean, all of us, we know the heart is desperately wicked. So just as human beings, we know we're capable of doing some pretty nasty stuff just on our own, just out of our own depravity, if you will. Right? We don't need the devil to do everything because we're capable of making a mess out of a lot of stuff just on our own. But evil is its more multidimensional. It's more nuanced, amen, and it's more complex and behind it all, behind every bit of it, is a singular supernatural intelligence. Praise the Lord. If, if there are demonic forces, it stands to reason that r true goodness and godliness would actually attract and stir up those powers to attack. I mean... In every other part of, of science or uh, natural, in the natural realm, and we know it's nothing more than a reflection of the spirit realm, opposites attract. And so it, it, it makes sense to me even logically that if, if, there, if there's a, a, a devil, if there is this evil, and it's a person, there's evil in the world, but there is a person, amen, who, is, who epitomizes evil. If that's true, then wherever, just think about that, wherever there is true godliness and righteousness and holiness, it's going to attract it, to attack it. Praise the Lord. So <clears throat> if we know what's out there and where it's coming from, then how do we face it without being overwhelmed by it? I mean, it's... It's great to know that there's an enemy. It's great to know that there's a devil. And we, we know that he's out here. He's operating in the world, operating even in people. But what good is that if we don't know how to overcome it? If we don't know how to combat that without being overwhelmed by this enemy? Now, if Jesus can be taken out here and attacked, immediately after all this affirmation and and, and uh, empowerment of God, then I don't think it's any great stretch for us to imagine that's going to happen, the kind of stuff that's going to happen to us as well. We are sons and daughters of God. We are well-pleasing in His sight. He's declared us to be righteous and holy in Christ, right? So consider what the, the, this text of Matthew 3 indicates. It tells us that in order to face true evil, we need to answer three questions. Who's the enemy? Where's the front or the battle lines? And what's our best defense? Praise the Lord. Who's the enemy? The enemy is an actual devil. A fallen angel who's leading fallen angels. Now, if you talk to unbelievers or just the world in general... They'll tell you, well, that's a primitive idea, you know. I mean, it's kind of superstitious, and it's a belief for simple people. 
But if you understand the, the, the reality of these, I mean, that's called dualism, I guess, in, in most places. They'll say, well, you know, uh, there's good and there's evil doesn't mean that there's a God and a devil. It just means that there's people do good things and they do bad things. But the truth is, if you study history and man in general and try to explain the world without the existence of the devil, then it's you that are being spiritually and intellectually naive. They like to make it sound like we're being stupid and naive for believing in the devil when, in fact, it's just the opposite of that. The more you study history, in fact, I just saw something uh, yesterday or the day before where they found this uh, an arche uh, archaeological find uh, that proved biblically how to treat a disease that we didn't even know existed until the last five or six years. So, I mean, it's incredible. Just because we don't, aren't able to put the science and the Bible together doesn't mean that they don't fit. It's just we try to make opposites of everything. I heard Joyce Meyer say the other day, talking about evolution, if we evolve from apes, how come there's still apes here? And how ticked off must they be that they didn't catch the, the ride to humanity? I mean, it doesn't make sense. If a, if a life form is evolving, then that life form will evolve. Right? Then how come they're still out there swinging from trees and down at Blank Park Zoo? I mean, just a little bit of logic unravels a lot of this stuff, but most of the time, science, we just don't want to, we don't want to look at it. We don't want to admit it. We just want to say, oh, yeah, well, that's just these stupid Christians. They're just ignorant, you know, and we have to kind of just put up with them. Bless their hearts. Praise God. So, it, to be practical, then let's, uh, if, if we know who the enemy is, then the second question we need to consider is where is the battle lines? Where's the front? Right? And the scripture tells us, beside the fact that there's a devil, his main point of attack, we see it in Matthew chapter 4, verse 3. So we know who the devil is. There is a devil. He's the enemy, period. Now, there's lots of other things that go on, and on, but behind all of that is him. Amen? So we know who the devil is. We know who the enemy is. Now we need to know where this point of attack is. When the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. That's it. Not only is this the attack against Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. That's the attack against us. That's the attack against every child of God, against every born-again believer. It's the one that he always uses. Amen? Amen. God just assured Jesus that he is his beloved son, is it? did he not? Amen. And immediately, I mean immediately, Satan directly assaults Jesus at that very spot. Praise the Lord. Make God prove that he loves you. See, this is what the enemy does to us. Oh, come on. If you're the son of God, if you're a child of God, let me see your... Let me see your bank book. Show me your prosperity. If thou be the Son of God, show me your healing. Show me the money. Show me something. Prove it. Right? He, he starts that same attack over and over and over. Amen? So he said, make God prove that he loves you. Make God prove. That you're powerful. He, he always wants proofs. He always wants demonstrations. He always wants assurances. Amen? But look, think about it. You don't have to ask somebody for demonstration, for assurances, or for proofs unless you doubt them. 
right? I mean, if, you, if somebody says, hey, show up here tomorrow, and I got a check for you for 100 bucks. You don't say, I mean, if you know them and if you trust them, you don't say, uh, would you mind showing me your bank balance? Or could we get, you know, a banker on the phone and just make sure that you actually have the $100? Now, if you don't know the person and you don't have a history with them, then it makes sense. You want some proof. You want some assurances that whatever you're doing for this 100 bucks, you're going to get your 100 bucks, right? But only because you doubt them. If you don't doubt them, you don't ask for anything. Just say, I'll see you here tomorrow. Right? So the devil's always trying to get us to doubt God, to question God, to demand proof. He, he demands proof of us, which causes us to start thinking, well, what if God doesn't do this? Or what if God doesn't do that? You see what I'm saying? Amen? So this is exactly what, this is exactly what the devil does. The, the assurance of God's full acceptance, questioning this, questioning uh, his unconditional love for us, it's what the enemy always does. Because, you know, you haven't been good enough. You, you haven't done everything right today, so, you know, I, 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 I think I might want to reconsider God's love for me today. Because I didn't act very lovable. Right? Or I didn't, I didn't do everything like I know I should have done it. Right? So I'm not sure that God's accepting me today. After all, I mean, I was doing stuff that was totally anti-God's commands. Praise the Lord. So if, if that's Satan's main front of attack, how does he try to accomplish it with us? Amen? Now, he says this. No, well, Jesus isn't going to be enough for you. His promises aren't going to be enough to get you through this mess. Grace isn't going to cover this screw up, buddy. This is too big. It's happened too many times. It's a repeat offense, right? Grace isn't going to be enough here. You're going to have to do something to prove that God loves you and that you love God. I need to see some fasting and some prayer. I need to see something that's going to tell me and show me that I'm his beloved son. That I'm accepted in the beloved, right? Let's look at John chapter 1 and verse 12. Now, I remember, you see, we have these thoughts. They're not random thoughts. It's spiritual warfare. A lot of times we're knee-deep in spiritual warfare before we even know that it's warfare. We think we're just having a, a mental conversation. And all the time, we're unraveling our faith. All the time, we're, we're, we're challenging God's promises for our life. We're, we're, you know, we're just, we're just, we just think we're thinking. But as many, that's why I'm saying, that's, why, that's what I'm trying to get across when I'm talking about the complexity and the multi-dimensional aspect of evil. It's not just, you don't just see that red little guy with the horns and the pitchfork. You're not going to see that. He's far more subtle than this. It's, it's, it's nuanced. It's, it's, it's ways that you don't even recognize it for what it is until you're halfway defeated. And then you go, my God, what's going on here? And he's already got you in a headlock. Amen, with your arm twisted behind your back. He's got you, you know, in a, in a compromised position. So, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become what? Sons of God. Same thing Jesus is, the Son of God, the beloved Son. My, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So as many as believed in him or received Jesus, to those same people gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Praise the Lord. So if you, if you rest in Christ's work for you, that's the key. It's not what you're doing for God. It's what he's already done for you. It's, fin it's a finished work. You're supposed to rest in him. You're supposed to accept what he has done. That's the only way, that's the only way you can receive him. Praise the Lord. So we, 
if we rest in that, if we, if we trust in His grace, then we can know that we are God's beloved children. And in Christ, we are well-pleasing to God. Praise the Lord. And that assurance is the taproot of the deepest truth of the Bible. It, it means that we are overcomers. That we are more than conquerors. That the enemy is under our feet. That we have authority over him. Praise the Lord. Satan wants at all costs to stop people from ever acquiring this kind of power. Once you know you have this power, he's as defeated for you as he is for Christ. See, the, you know, the scripture talks about he is seated in heavenly places until we, until the church makes his enemies his footstool. Now, it sounds like a, a contradiction because we already know that Jesus has already defeated the enemy. He's a defeated foe. He's overcome him. It says that he, he humiliated him openly, paraded him before all of the demons, all the spirits, all the, all the people in paradise, you know, and, and just said, this is the guy, and he's nothing. He's overcome. But because of the way the, the, this complexity of spiritual warfare, you can be victorious and still be fighting this guy, not even knowing that you're fighting him. You, he can still manipulate and control you to a place where, see, we, we're victorious as long as we're walking in Christ, as long as we're in Christ, as long as we being in Christ, which is what we just talked about, operating from grace, operating from the finished work of the cross, we are more than conquerors. We are victorious. He's got to get you out of that understanding. He's got to get you to a place of compromise or a place of uh, questioning the promise of God, the affirmation of God, the acceptance of God. That's why he says in another place, there is therefore now no condemnation. Paul says, you know, oh my God, who, who can overcome this? Who can be victorious? Because I, no matter what I do, I still screw up. The harder I try, the better to be, the worse I am. You know, I, I, I want to do right, but I'm still doing wrong. The more I focus on the trying to do good, the more I see how much I fail. Oh God, who can deliver us from this mess? Thank God for Jesus Christ. The very next verse, Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation. Hallelujah. Now, you just heard Paul all through chapter 7 talking about why he has every reason to be condemned, why he has every reason to feel guilty, to be ashamed, to feel like a failure. And immediately then, after thank God for this Jesus Christ, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How do you walk in the Spirit? By the finished work of Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is no Spirit in the law. Right. Not the, there isn't a spiritual uh, condition that is achieved through the law. Right. The Spirit came as a result of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. So walking in the Spirit isn't walking in perfect obedience to God. It's walking in the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ. And there, there is therefore no condemnation, never any condemnation. And that makes you victorious over every attack, every lie of the enemy. He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your promises. He wants to steal your relationship. He wants to steal your financial blessing. He wants to steal your health. Amen? And the only way he can do it is he's got to get you into condemnation. He's got to get you to start doubting what God has promised. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, for Christians who know this in principle, and I'd say that's 60% uh, of, the, uh, of the church, 
they didn't understand the principle of grace and, and God's blessing and God's promises. That we're adopted, that we're loved by God, that we are sons and daughters, right? So those people who have a kind of teeter-totter Christianity, if you will, which is a big, big percentage, Satan wants to slide you back into self-image. An image that is based not on Christ, but on you. Something that causes you to look at your moral performance. Mm -hmm. To look at your goodness. To look at your effort. Now, sometimes that's great. Because there are some days when I'm really putting 100% in. You know, I'm really going for it. Well, not days, but parts of days. <laughs> you know, where you just... Really getting after it. But the problem is, because we're human, we can't maintain that. We don't, we're not consistently living that way. But Jesus did. That's why we need to be in him. Because in him, the enemy has no approach to us. He has no access to us. Amen? So what's our best defense? Let's look at this in Matthew chapter 4 again. Let's look at verses 4. Begin at verse 4 here. Matthew 4, verse 4. But Jesus answered and said, It's written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Right? How about verse 7? Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Uh -huh. Verse 10. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Praise the Lord. Now we can find plenty of other things to say, but this is what Jesus was saying, right? So Jesus doesn't deal with Satan in a superstitious, kind of magical way. And what I mean by that, he doesn't just blast him with his glory, which he could have done, right? Right? So he doesn't do what charismatic Christianity often kind of tells us we should do. Get back in the name of Jesus, you know. Her! Wrestle that demon out of somebody. And, you know, I'm not saying there aren't times when we need to command and declare when the enemy is, is operating in a situation. But the vast majority of the time, you don't see Jesus doing that. He uses... His knowledge of Scripture, his, and through that knowledge of Scripture, his relationship with the Father to overcome the enemy. You can scream and holler all you want, but if you don't have truth, you're just a screaming and hollering idiot, you know? Without the truth, all the screaming in the world isn't going to change anything. Right. Now, sometimes we get excited because we have truth, and we get a little loud and maybe a little boisterous, but it isn't how loud we're yelling that causes the devil to leave. It's the truth that causes the enemy to leave. Amen? You can scream and holler a lie or a half-truth all day long, and it doesn't faze him at all. He'll sit right there and listen to it. Right. It's when you're declaring the truth, and you can do that in a still, small voice. Mm -hmm. And he will pack his bags and go. He can't. He's a liar. He cannot handle the truth. He can't deal with truth, not God's truth. Because it's, it's the victory. It's the reinforcement of the victory that Jesus has already, amen, achieved. Praise the Lord. So, uh, Satan, you know, he doesn't generally control us uh, with fang marks in the flesh. I mean, that's Hollywood. I'm not saying he can't. I'm just saying generally that's not the way the enemy manipulates us and controls us. He normally does it with lies in the heart or to the spirit. Praise the Lord. If you think about in Genesis with Adam and Eve, it's the same, very same thing. Had they responded the way Jesus responded, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. Right. But instead of saying, declaring what God had said to them, they listened to what the devil said when the devil said, did God surely say that you'll die? Right. Right. 
I mean, surely he didn't say that. You know, and the more they listened to what he was saying, this is warfare, church. And, and I mean, it's, I, it's, he's subtle. And that's what it says. He's the most subtle beast of the field. So he had them, he had uh, Eve nuanced into this position before she even knew what was going on. The next thing she knows, she's thinking, hey, I'll bet God would actually like this if I did it. Because after all, I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to, I'm going to know good and evil, not just good, and, and I'll be like God. Right? But what she didn't know was she was already like God. Right. She didn't need to know evil. She was innocent. Right. Which is what exactly what the devil does the same thing to us. Right. You know, if you, just, if you just knew a little bit more about sin, how to avoid it, how to not do this, how to do this, how to do better, how to do that, well, you'd be more like God. You'd be acceptable. You could, you could you know, get, get along better with God. Mm-hmm. And so we're out there climbing trees every day trying to find some fruit that's going to make us more like God. And by the time we get halfway up the tree and we got the apple in our hand or the pomegranate or whatever it is, it's about that long before we realize, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be in this tree. Right. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I don't need this fruit. Right. I'm accepted. I'm beloved. You, that's the nuance. That's the, 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 the subtleness, if you will, of Satan. He never comes with a bold slap across your face and says, come on. He doesn't do it that way. Right. He'll sidle up to you with his arm around you, whisper in your ear. And before you know it, everything's turning red. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. You know, it's just so, and, and here it is. He tempts you into it, gets you to do it, and then makes you feel guilty right. afterwards. Right. Causes you to then be ashamed. Praise the Lord. Everything Satan says that insinuates or, or blatantly denies the promises and the revelation of God is answered with Scripture mm-hmm. every single time. Mm-hmm. Jesus quotes uh, Deuteronomy 8 and 3. He quotes uh, Deuteronomy 6.16. 6, and then finally, Deuteronomy 6.13. Right. God's own promises, right. God's assurances, and God's revelations. That's what he uses to defeat the enemy. So when he comes and does that kind of stuff, you need to remind him, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am accepted in the beloved. I am his perfect son. Amen. I am God's beloved. I am his beloved child in whom he is well pleased. I have nothing to prove. It's all been proven for me. I've been accepted. I've been affirmed. I've been empowered. Amen? See, God's promises and assurances make you invulnerable to Satan's attacks. When we really know who we are in Christ, the devil hasn't got a leg to stand on. He has no leverage with us anymore. That's why grace is so critically important. It isn't about getting away with stuff. It's about overcoming an enemy. And it's the only way we can do it. Anybody in their right mind that has tried to live for God any length of time knows this to be true. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Yes, it is. So here's what I want you to understand here as we start to wrap up here. We don't want to disconnect the temptation to not believe God and the baptism. Because they are connected. That's why he says, and this is my beloved, right after the baptism, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Then the spirit that had just descended on him like a dove leads him 
to the wilderness where the enemy is going to attack. Satan comes to Jesus because Jesus has been commissioned, because Jesus has been empowered by God for a mission. That's what just happened at the baptism. Right? He has been identified. He's been declared. Now he's on a mission. Immediately, because he's been empowered, because he now has a mission from God, Satan shows up. Amen? Well, let me remind you. You have a commission. You have a mission. You've been empowered. The Holy Spirit is to lead and to guide you. Amen? So you are in the same boat. Praise the Lord. Look at Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 20. We forget this a lot of times in our struggle to survive Christianity. We forget that this isn't supposed to be about survival. This is supposed to be about victory, about overcoming an enemy, about taking territory, about expanding the kingdom of God. So he says, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs will follow them. We, we say this every service. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it won't hurt them. And they'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This is part of the mission. This is part of the, the commission, right? This is part of what we've been empowered for. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, we don't have to, you know, be freaky about it. We just go through our life, and the opportunities for this are there. Yep. They'll be there. Maybe not every minute of every day, but the Holy Spirit will lead you to perform the mission that you've been empowered for. Yes. You don't get to pick the field. Amen. Yep. You just go. Yep. And he'll set you up for encounters that will reveal the power and the glory of God. Glory. Doesn't always, it isn't always dramatic. It isn't always, you know, like uh, like a revival meeting. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's a slow kind of grinding out process. Right. Just loving somebody. Just being there. Just, just taking the crap when they just, you know, kind of throw up on you and tell you, that's just garbage. You don't know what you're talking about. You're an idiot. You just hang in there living before them. Allow the Spirit of God to minister how He wants to. And little by little, they're, by the Spirit, they're drawn. Doors open, opportunities come. It's just as supernatural. Believe me, there's nothing more supernatural than the born-again experience. Hallelujah. However that tra transpires. Some people, it's a shout, and it's a rolling in the aisle, and it's a hooping and a hollering and sweating. And, and other people, it's a quiet, personal, private thing. Yeah. We don't care. We don't care what the, how it manifests itself in the actual fact of it. We just care that it gets done. Amen? Hallelujah. That it happens. Praise the yeah. Lord. That's, that, that's all that matters. God can do it any way he wants to. Praise the Lord. So we've got one more resource here for this spiritual warfare. And it's right here in these scriptures in Matthew 3 and 4. It's Jesus himself. Yes. Right? Look, let's look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Four fifteen. yes. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Yes. Well, now how was he tempted if he was without sin? Well, we just read it. Yep. He was tempted to not believe God. Right. He was tempted to not believe his identity. Mm -hmm. He was tempted to question whether or not he in fact was the beloved son in whom God was well pleased the incarnate Christ. Mm -hmm. That's what the devil was after, to get him to question this. Amen. Mm -hmm. He wasn't tempting him to go get a whore. Right. Sorry for my crass. But he wasn't tempting him to go get a fifth of Jack Daniels. Right? right? right. 
He wasn't tempting him to go rob the rabbis. He was tempting him not to believe what God had said about him. Right? God is not as concerned about the temptation for us to do immoral things. Now, we don't want to do it because we want to be moral people. We want to be good examples. But when we stumble, that's not the issue. That's not the big concern of God. God's concern is that we lose our identity because then we might as well be pagans. Right? right? right. If, we're, if we don't know who we are in Christ, all the rest of this Christianity is just bogus. It might as well be like the old days where they would bring the pr prostitutes into the temple. Right. Yippee. Right? Mm -hmm. It's Sunday morning. BYOB. Yeah. It, it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. Because we'd have lost the empowering ability to, to touch people's lives, to change people's lives. That only comes by our identity of being in Christ, who we are in Christ. Right. And that's what's uppermost in the mind of God. So he says here, he, we have this high priest. Now think about it. We're talking Old Testament here. The high priest in the Old Testament was not only a counselor. People that came with their, whatever their issues were, they came with those problems and then he would... What? He would offer sacrifices that they would, of course, have to bring. And also, he was the healer. Yeah. Read all through Leviticus, you know, Deuteronomy, anywhere back in there, and you'll find every time somebody had leprosy, what did they do? They had to go take him to the priest. Right. And the priest had to then declare them healed or not healed. Right. They were the healers. They, they didn't necessarily have, you know, some doctor MD. Mm -hmm. They had a, a, a high priest. So that's what he's telling us. Jesus, he, he was, he's the priest. He's the counselor. He can relate to our humanity. Right. He knows what it's like to be tempted to believe that you're not who God said you are. Right. That's the temptation that he's talking about here. Uh -huh. See, that's the, because what? Because that's the big temptation. Right. That's the one that's important. That's, if, listen, if there was some other temptation that would have been more effective, the devil would have used it. Right. He used the one that had the most power, that had the most influence. Yep. Get him to question whether he's the Messiah, mm -hmm. whether he really is this beloved son of God, whether he really is accepted by God, endorsed by God, empowered by God. You see? Amen? Look at Hebrews chapter 4, then verse 16. Next verse. Let us therefore, because we have this high priest that knows what it's like to be challenged, to have your identity challenged, mm -hmm. and he overcame it right. without giving in, without giving up. Because of that, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We can come boldly, no matter how screwed up we are, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because Jesus understands that the devil's going to do everything he can to get us to question our identity, our accessibility to God, our acceptability with God. But because we have this Jesus who understands it, who's been through that temptation, he says, just throw your shoulders back and come on in. Expect grace, and that's what's going to be waiting for you there. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? Praise the Lord. That's, that's the whole idea. That's, that's what the devil's after. This is real spiritual warfare. This is, this is the, the crux of it. This is the thrust of it. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Come on. Hallelujah. Tempted in every way, it said in verse 15, but without sin. What is What is sin? Unbelief. Sin is not the individual things that we do. Sin is a failure to believe God. How do I know that? Because people, there are people who will live good lives, never murder anybody, never rape anybody, never went with a prostitute, never, uh, you know, got drunk, never, you know, did drugs, I mean, did a lot of good stuff, you know, but they didn't believe that Jesus Christ was their Savior. Right. They're lost. Right. 
their good works will not save them. Amen? Amen? The obverse of that is all of our stupid behavior isn't going to make us go to hell. Right. Thank you, Lord. Now, in a natural thing, you'd have to say these people are going to really be upset. Right? right? Come on, I lived a good life. And this guy, he was an idiot. <laughs> He's in heaven. Because he believed. The two guys hanging on the cross side, uh, beside Jesus, were, they, were, they were there for the same reason. They were all there for the same reason. Right. One ends up in hell. And the other, Jesus says, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Why? Because he believed. Right. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Right. The only difference was one believed and one didn't. Hallelujah. Jesus is there to fight Satan's lies. He's there to fight Satan's lies in our hearts and Satan's works in the world. Amen? Amen. And he does it the same way. By convincing us that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Because if he's going to defeat the wickedness and the evil in the world, he's going to have to use us to do it. Right. We overcome it by the Spirit of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. We don't rely only on the word of the Lord. It's good, it's important, it's, 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 it's great, but we also need to rely on the Lord of the word. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. We don't just have a book, as perfect as it is. We have Jesus himself, that word made flesh. And he has done it all for us so that we can overcome it all in him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I, I just challenge you, you want to give the devil a black eye? You don't need to wrestle him. You don't need to scream and holler at him. You don't need to I bind the devil in this and all that. I mean... I, Okay, I get it. I, I understand that. I'm not saying don't you, you, you shouldn't do it. You can't do it. It's Bible. You can do it. I'm saying the way you defeat the devil is the same way Jesus did. Right. You stand on what God has declared you to be. Mm -hmm. And the scripture says he will flee. Right. Doesn't mean he won't come back because if you look at Jesus' life, he kept popping up. Yeah. But he kept getting defeated and run off again and again and again. And he has defeated him. And now that's what he's talking about when he says, now we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. How? Because we don't really have to fight a battle. What we do is declare the victory to the enemy that Jesus has already won. We keep reminding the devil that he's defeated. And the way that we do that is by declaring our identity in Jesus Christ. Amen. He hates us. Yeah. That's why he hates us. Because we are like another Jesus. Every time he looks at you and you stand in the identity that Christ has given you, it's like looking at Jesus all over again. It's like reliving that humiliation that he suffered and will suffer throughout eternity. It's not surprising that we get empowered. We get blessed. This isn't to frighten you because we have the victory, right? Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, it's... It, it's not surprising that when we have a great victory in Christ, Mike can tell you this, during prayer meetings and during the, the uh, Eastern Gate House of Prayer, have a great, you know, manifestation, move, revelation, what happens? Crap happens. Within the next two or three days, stupid stuff happens. It's to get you to disbelieve what God has done. He, can't, he has no power over you except what you yield to him, what you relinquish to him. Yep, yep. We are victorious. Yep. We win. Hallelujah. Not only in the end, but in the interim as well. Mm -hmm. We just have to remember who we are in Christ, and that empowers us to overcome, to lay hands on the sick, to see him recover, to cast out demons, to do all the things that God has told us that we can do and will do Hallelujah. in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Say amen. 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 God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
go in the power of his might.